Benvenuti scholars. Today we're going to demystify the gap or the need or what we're going to call the problem space. And in that problem space, it ultimately leads to your research problem statement. I'm Dr. Nick Marquette and in our continuing series of preparing to write a dissertation, today we're going to take you step by step through a rather easy way to take all the mystery out of the problem space that'll lead ultimately to a solid research problem statement to get you on your way to writing your dissertation. So let's get started. I like to take this topic and break it down into smaller parts. And I like to articulate it in a simple mathematical formula. So what is known plus what is not known plus what is needed to be known plus the argument creates that problem space. So what is known as we said in our earlier video, this is where you bring out the current literature and make it clear what is the current state of affairs and what have we so far established in this particular area. What is not known is pieces of the literature that have yet to be explored or examined, suggesting that your research may be able to fill that gap. But that's not enough because there also has to be a need for us to look at this particular <clears throat> study. That uh, need could be societally, could be professionally. Uh, for example, you know, in the pandemic right now, uh, there is a compelling uh, need to explore online education. It's boomed like never before. Or perhaps there is an issue that has billions of dollars of implications every year like employee turnover and the need addresses that multi-billion dollar problem. So the need can both be established by what is going on in society or what is going on professionally and with the missing pieces of the literature and they combine together to help you develop that argument which ultimately becomes the problem space. So let's take that formula we just discussed and apply it to a real world practical example of a student that I worked with just last week. Last week I worked with Letisa Barrett and the first thing we established and she had several articles uh, that came up with this conclusion that it was known that first generation first year students transitioning from secondary to post secondary institutions experience challenges academically and socially. Now notice that the who in this study is underlined and that's important because we maintain that consistency throughout. Latisa was also able to show what was not known and it is not known how first generation first year students transitioning from secondary to post secondary institutions describe their experiences in a TRIO student support services program. So again, you see the consistency of who is involved in this particular area of research. Her need focused again on the same people, first year students transitioning from secondary to post-secondary institutions and how they described the influence of the TRIO student support services program with tutoring and academic advising programs on their self-efficacy. And once again, you see that consistency in who is involved in this particular area of research. Finally, we bring it all together in our argument and we pull in data from various sources that complements the research that she's been doing to build and establish what was known and what is not known. And you can see here, approximately 89% of first generation students do not graduate after six years. And 30% of first year students drop out their first year. I don't know about you, but that's compelling to me to explore this topic more thoroughly, because if that many people are dropping out, then there's something worth looking into here. So similarly, she also adds to the argument because institutions lose financially due to these dropout rates. And she brings it all together that if we know how these students perceive the influence of the TRIO support services on their self-efficacy, we may be able to bring something of value 
to decision makers or policy makers that could ultimately help them to better serve students and to build a more financially stable institution. So it may be helpful to continue this conversation in a different way. A picture, if you will, a funnel where we put what is known into that funnel alongside what is not known. And then we add a dash of the big picture societal issue and out from it comes a clear and compelling argument. In the last example, which was a qualitative study, we noted that 89% of these students don't graduate within six years. I find that compelling. We also argued in that, that with the knowledge that this study may provide, we may be able to inform decision makers and policy makers um, so that they are better able to serve students and better able to develop financially stable institutions. From that argument comes out a single, concise, and clear research problem statement. Now, different types of studies have different kinds of problem statements. There's qualitative and quantitative studies, and we'll get into those details in our next video to help you take the problem space and turn it into your research problem statement. So one area that is vexing to a lot of emerging scholars who are defending their problem space with the literature is how many articles does this take? How old can they be? How new should they be? And this is rather simple to answer. It depends. Often if you're working with a topic that's been around for years, maybe an educational based topic, you'll start a little bit older to set the stage. Consider Star Wars a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. So self-efficacy or zone of proximal uh, development or ZPD, these type of things didn't start in the last couple years. So naturally you're going to have some literature that sets the stage that will not be recent. But that should quickly speed up to what's going on right now and why there is a compelling argument for your research problem statement. And that can't be done unless we're using recent literature. Now, in a perfect world, there would be an article that says, do exactly this, but we don't live in a perfect world. And usually, That'll be between three to as many as eight articles to help you build the argument for your research problem. <clears throat> and that's exactly how you have to consider it. You have to consider it that you're making a scholarly argument. So recently we went through this pandemic and the literature regarding this pandemic is going to be extremely recent and may not be as deep if we were looking at something like literacy in education. This also applies to technology. Technology changes so quickly that technology topics are most likely going to have the bulk of the research arguing for the need to do the study probably within the last few years. Also in this process, you're not just using scholarly articles, you're also grabbing things maybe from the census or other places that produce data that says this is a multi-billion dollar issue, or this is affecting 50 million people. These type of things also lead to the argument to do your study. I'll often say you're making a scholarly sales job because you have to convince your committee with the evidence that what you're proposing to research truly needs to be researched. So what did we learn in this video? Well, the first thing we did is we took the argument for the problem space and we broke it down into a somewhat easy to understand formula. And it starts simply by answering, what do we know? And then answering, what don't we know? And then answering, what do we need to know? And then finally, what is our argument for doing this research? And when you add, what we know to what we don't know to what we need to know in the argument, you have your problem space. Hope this video was helpful to you. Uh, I'm gonna continue to build on the parts of the dissertation with subsequent videos and we should have more out for you soon.